Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, I was very sad to know that uh, Colin Powell passed away this uh, week and our flags are at half mast, a great statesman. Of course, it freaked out a lot of people because he was vaccinated and still passed away. So I thought this, this week it'd be a good idea to sort of review the state of vaccination in our country, in the state of Texas worldwide, and what things we ought to be thinking about, the importance of booster shots and how it all fits in the, in the context. So, you know, the world map hasn't really changed much. Uh, you, <laughs> we're doing okay, a little bit better. United Kingdom continues to really, really do very badly. Uh, it's interesting if you look at the cases worldwide, uh, United States is in red and you can see our, we're beginning to come down, but interestingly, Europe, you'll notice that big peak. Europe is beginning to go up and we've actually pretty much crossed. We're doing better than Europe, which I thought would never happen, but it's all because of the United Kingdom. Check this, check this out. The United Kingdom continues to go up, actually. It's really bad. They're, they're almost at their peak level at Delta, even though 67% of the country is vaccinated. They've had an increase in 30% in their uh, case numbers and death rates have increased by 11%. In contrast, same vaccination status, look at Italy. Italy's coming down, continues to come down. Their case rate has decreased by 18%. Deaths have decreased by 23%. And you wonder why? They're following Lily's five-point plan. That's why. If the United Kingdom would do that, they could thank Lily. They'd be in a lot better shape. And we are doing okay, but not great. I, I, I'm a little disturbed because I listen to the news and everybody's going, oh, we're doing great. We're, you know, it's finally behind us. Well, it's not, it's not really behind us. We're at 726,000 deaths, and while it's falling, the rate of fall is beginning to slow, and you can see that very distinctly, and we're still well above the first and second waves, and we only have 57% of the country fully vaccinated. So it's a little early to declare victory. We don't want to pull the United Kingdom, do we? Uh, and I think we need to, you know, really continue to focus on the people who are unvaccinated. And look at this. IHME, just as we said all the time, they're projecting they were going to be living with this virus for a long time because we have so many people who remain unvaccinated. And, you know, even the people who are vaccinating, their immunity is beginning to wane. And we're seeing a, a re resurgence of cases in, even in people who are vaccinated. So it's really interesting uh, what's... You know, I, I've showed this before, but if you look at admissions to hospitals, it's mostly in the older age group, 70 and above 65. But see this, this little line down here? That's a, an increase in people who are 30 to 49 years of age. And I think this is pushing a lot of the impetus to try and get boosters to a much broader uh, population. And, you know, I said about a month ago, I would just make boosters available to everybody over the age of 18. My only concern was really whether or not the myocarditis uh, would be a problem. And as I reviewed last week's the large data sets from Israel and two big studies in the United States, it's less than four per 100,000 people, you know, so it's not a big problem. And so I think it just, it'd be smart just to begin to allow booster shots for almost anybody who's uh, eligible and, and just increase the eligibility. The other thing is, Look at uh, the uh, daily deaths per 100,000. You know, I've mentioned before, even though most of the infections are in younger people, the deaths remain in older people. But look at this little bump. That is in the group that are between 35 and 50. And so that, again, is a reason why I think we're moving more and more towards uh, providing boosters for younger people. Because uh, it looks like there is waning resistance with, uh, with time over the last vaccination. You know, but when we say things are going great and it's not that bad, this is really kind of disturbing. Uh, in September, COVID-19 was the leading, second leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, heart disease, thank goodness for heart disease. Otherwise, COVID-19 would be the leading cause of death in the United States, which is terrible. And even though we say it's not, you know, younger people are, you know, resistant and, and more able to survive, in the 35 to 55 year old group in August and September, it was the number one cause of death in that group. Now people of between 35 and 50 aren't supposed to die, you know, so we don't see a lot of case, you know, evidence of mortality, but in, with COVID, it's the number one cause of death in that group. And again, I think this is the reason why there's more and more pressure to put booster shots on for younger and younger folks. And I think one of the saddest thing was if you look in June, this is 
deaths in June, and this little tiny green bar is the deaths that are actually from people who are fully vaccinated. But the dark blue bar is avoidable deaths. That's, that's all the people, 90,000 people who passed away in September who probably would not have died had they simply been vaccinated. So, you know, even though we're claiming a little victory because people are getting, you know, the population is getting uh, more and more uh, resistant, we still have a lot of cases. We still have over 80 million susceptible people. We've got to get them vaccinated. There's still going to be a lot of deaths. As I said, we're at 724,000 deaths. We don't want to get to 800,000. So how is Texas doing? We're, we're not doing as well as Italy. So remember I said last week, you know, when you start thinking about community spread, anything under 10 cases per 100,000 is low level of virus uh, around. And that's a, that's, a, that's a good number, less than 10. Between 10, 10 and 50 is moderate. Most of Texas is moderate. You know, uh, Dimmitt County, our friends in Dimmitt, 25 per 100,000. Harris County, 15 per 100,000. We want to look more like Italy, which is less than 5 per 100,000. And I mean Italy, Italy, not Italy, Texas, which, by the way, in Ellis County, they're having about 40 per 100,000. So we need Italy, Texas to start looking a little bit more like Italy, Italy. What about in the uh, Texas Medical Center? I put a big red line to say, when, is, when am I going to feel comfortable that there's a low enough cases? That's about 200 cases per 100,000. Or, 200, yes, uh, 200 cases in the community, not per 100,000. It's less than 10 per 100,000. But we're at 925. We're five times that. We're 925 cases per day last week on average. We ought to be at 200 or less if we're going to be at 10 or less per 100,000. And, and then if you look at hospitalizations, yeah, they're going down, which is great. But we're still at 100 admissions a day on average last week, which is just way too many. So as we think about, you know, the state of the virus worldwide, you know, we can't get away from this virus until the entire world is vaccinated. And if you look at the vaccination map, it's really kind of disturbing because there are whole countries that have less than 2 or 3% of the population. Botswana uh, is now up to 23%, but uh, Kenya is around... 2.5%. Uh, and so those are going to be hot spots where virus is going to replicate and continue to mutate. And when we think about variants of concern, it's going to happen in places where there's a lot of viral replication. And while we're debating giving third shots, you know, <laughs> and boosters, there are parts of the world that haven't gotten one shot. And, and that, I think, is the big issue. And then the other really interesting thing is we're, we're very America-focused you know, we're talking about the vaccines we give, you know, Moderna, Pfizer, J&J. &J. Most of the, that's not who's providing most of the vaccines for the world. Actually, the Chinese have provided most of the vaccinations. If you look, CoronaVac and Sinopharm have been the vast majority of the vaccines produced and given worldwide. Pfizer is the one of the three approved in the United States that has actually uh, been uh, delivered a lot around the country. But, you know, the, um, this is a real concern because in the, in the rest of the world, even where there has been vaccinations, uh, these are in older people are beginning to have waning immunity. Uh, there's a huge concern now that not only uh, have many people not been vaccinated, but the people who have been vaccinated are beginning to have waning immunity. And so the WHO has now recommended that anybody over, this, over 60 start getting a third dose. And as best we can tell, the Chinese uh, uh, vaccines are not as effective they don't have this, the same uh, durability of immunity and their combination of you know, some killed virus and just recombinant protein that is not as good as the mRNA vaccine. So we can expect that those countries that have been vaccinated with the Chinese vaccines are going to probably start needing booster shots uh, fairly soon. One good study that uh, was done with, uh, here by Robert Atmar's group uh, he's the PI of a very important study looking at whether or not boosters need to be the same shot or if it can be a different shot. So really interesting study. Uh, I think it's very important for managing the pandemic worldwide. Uh, they, they took about 450 individuals. One third had been vaccinated against Pfizer, one third against, with um, Moderna, and one third with J&J. &J. And then they did a whole bunch of combinations where they used a second booster uh, or a, a booster that was different from the original vaccine. And what they showed was it was actually not only as good, but maybe even better to have a heterologous booster. A really nice paper, very important, shows the safety of providing 
uh, a different uh, vaccine as a booster, and also that you had very good response, means that wherever in the world that people have gotten Chinese vaccines, for example, uh, it might be reasonable to get boosted with some other vaccine or any other vaccine. It was, it was a very important paper as we think about it uh, in terms of managing the worldwide pandemic. I wanted to talk about Colin Powell, who, who just who passed away even though he'd been vaccinated. Uh, and because he falls into a category that we've reviewed uh, with the Israeli data. Remember, uh, there were 500 cases that, of people who had been fully vaccinated who uh, had very bad outcomes, either were hospitalized in the ICU or passed away. And when they looked at it, it was 40% of those people had immune compromise and the average age was over the age of 80. So, you know, Colin Powell had multiple myeloma, which is a, it, like a cancer of the bloodstream, but it's mostly of immune cells. And so he would, falls into that category of people who over the age of 80 plus uh, had a problem with his immune uh, system. And so, you know, it's not surprising, uh, but I know it, it's scary for everybody who's, you know, older and sees a fully vaccinated person uh, uh, getting coronavirus and uh, having a bad outcome. But again, he fell into that category of being older and immune compromised. And if you look at um, some recent data from Israel, most of the problems are in the 10% that are unvaccinated in Israel. 90% of the bad outcomes are in 10% of the individuals. And you can see this in the unvaccinated. Th these are the bad outcomes. It's by, by far and away those that are unvaccinated. But there are people who've been vaccinated, it's much lower level, uh, and even people who had vaccinations and booster shots. But again, it's, it's much, much smaller. So the real uh, epidemic in Israel is being driven by the 10% or so who remain uh, unvaccinated. So this week I want to end with the, uh, a couple of big shout outs. The first thing is uh, I'm going to give, you know, Italy another, another big shout out for following the Lily Five Point Plan. But my sister has been all over me saying, look, obviously the rest of the world in our country is not following that plan. So what are we going to do? And I've had a couple of viewers say like, well, what are we going to do living with the virus since we're obviously not going to be free of the virus? So n next week or within the next week or two, we're going to get the Lily plan for how humans can sur survive or live with COVID. I got to get her motivated, but you know, she's because she's distracted right now with her, you know, being selected to go into space. I also want a big shout out for Helen Heslop, uh, the medical director of the Center for Cell and Gene Therapy at Baylor College of Medicine. She was elected to the National Academy of Medicine. She's an outstanding investigator. We're very excited for her. Also to the Hess Corporation, who partners with us on their annual toy release and we do a STEM curriculum with them and they are uh, just released their new their new Hess version and I think it's airplanes this week or this year so we're very excited about that and then of course I've mentioned before that Lily was selected for her uh, trip to space uh, I understand that she is going to be having a press conference about that we're very excited about it it's getting a little you know busy around the house with her you know prominence and all the anticipation. I'll try to get her to focus on her plan to live with the virus, but you know, we'll see. She's busy. Anyway, very excited about uh, Lily's traveling coming up and can't wait to see how she does. And until then, I will can't wait to see you until next week. Hello everyone. My name is Lily Klotman and I've been chosen by NASA as the first dog in the modern era to go up in space. I gotta tell you, I'm really looking forward to it. Lily, Lily, what is your itinerary during your space flight? Well, I plan on finding out if smells in space are the same as smells on Earth. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that one. So, Lily, where do you think this will put you in history? With dogs like Lassie and Snoopy? My place in history compared to other dogs? Well, I don't know who Lassie is, and I don't rap. So Snoop Dogg has nothing to worry about. Will going up in space make me the most popular dog on Earth? I think so. I should get many more pieces of fan mail. And a better parking spot. Lily, objects appear larger in space. Will this bother you? Well, here on Earth, most objects are larger than me anyways. So I'll feel right at home. I would like to speak in canine for a moment for all of my doggy friends. Aww. 
Well, I thank you all for coming. I'm certainly looking forward to next week, but it's time for my afternoon walk. Hey, Lily, how did the press conference go? I think it went well. Lily, you do know that uh, when they were talking about Snoopy, they were talking about Snoopy, Lucy, Peanuts. They weren't talking about Snoop Dogg, the rapper. Yeah, I know. I was just pulling their tail. 